بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بأحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوى صدق الله العظيم Respected brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah brothers and sisters in these times of confusion and times of a lot of differences and confusions which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself had mentioned فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِي فَسَيَرَى اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Those amongst you who will live after me and he was saying this to his companions so you can imagine our time. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when addressing his family and his companions he said فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِي فَسَيَرَى اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا those amongst you who are, who are going to live after me, you're going to see a lot of confusion. So in a time of confusion, what, what should we do? Where is the clarity? Where is the guidance? Then the Prophet ﷺ said, You know, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِّينَ مِنْ بَعْدِي عَضُّوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِذِ Now the question here is like, why do we not? Why did the Prophet ﷺ not say, follow the Quran? The Prophet ﷺ should have told us, follow the Quran. Why did he say, Alaykum bi sunnati? Isn't the Quran more superior than the Sunnah? Isn't the Quran more superior than the Hadith? So the answer to that is, is the Quran is the text. And the hadith and the sunnah is the embodiment of that text. When you read the DMV book, or you read the driving book, there's so much you're going to get from the driving book. Even reading the driving book might make you even more confused. But when you see an expert driver, a trainer, and he's putting that driving in example for you, He's demonstrating for you the driving. Then the driving, there is no question about it. There is no doubt about it. There is no confusion about it. Because now the driver has showed you and as an example and demonstrated for you what is that driving book telling you. You're reading about a U-turn inside the driving book. You're thinking, okay, how is this U-turn? And then the driver, he shows you your U-turn and you're sitting on the passenger seat. Which one is more easier? Which one will you make? You might make mistakes in both, but which one will be easier? Is the one where there's a physical example. My dear brothers and sisters, we have to understand what is the hadith and what is the sunnah. The hadith and the sunnah is the embodiment of the Quran. It is demonstrating the teachings of the Quran. So after which there is no, there is no ambiguity. There is no confusion, there is no misunderstanding because the Prophet ﷺ with his life and with his example has shown us this. With his life, with his example, with his, you know, demonstrating every day of his life, he was the, what do you say, the, the living Qur'an. That is why Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha, Ummul Mu'mineen. When she was asked about the character of the Prophet, what did she say? She said, "Kana khuluquhu al-Quran." The character of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that he was a walking Quran. If you want to see the Quran in in a, in living example, you see the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If you want to see the Quran actually demonstrated, so that we can see it with our own eyes, you see the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Everything has been preserved in his life. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So with that being said, the Quran and the Hadith and the examples of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these are our ways out of this confusion. Where he says, فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِي فَسَيَرَى اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا 
those amongst you who will live after me, you're going to see a lot of confusions. You're going to see a lot of new things. You're going to see a lot of differences of opinion. But hold on to my sunnah and my example. And follow the sunnah of the Khulafai Rashidin, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. Abdu Aliha bin Nawajid. Hold on to it with your back molars. Hold on to it tightly. Because brothers and sisters, you open up the Quran and you're reading, where is the, where is the example of the Quran? Where is the Quran embodied? Where is the Quran put to practice? The Quran was put to practice in the life of the Prophet. The Quran was put to practice in the life of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. That is where the Quran comes to life. That is where the Quran right, manifests itself, demonstrates itself. Just like you have any book, you have the driver's, driver's book. Where does the driver book manifest itself? In the driver's training. So, brothers and sisters, we must appreciate the hadith of the Prophet and the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and make these our lens. This is your perspective. That our perspective in this world is the Quran and the hadith. If we look at the world through this lens, everything and all these other confusions that exist, they will clear themselves. All the confusions will be clarified when we look at everything through this lens, from the lens of the Quran and Sunnah. For that, we have to go to the right sources. For that, we have to sit in the company of the ulama. A lot of people, they were asking questions. So we said, okay, we'll have a dars of tafsir. Every Thursday night from Maghrib to Isha, alhamdulillah, we have a dars of tafsir. Explain in the Quran. Every Saturday night, we have a dars of the hadith, of the Sunnah of the Prophet. So we explain the hadith. Because if you're going to go on TikTok, and try to learn your deen through TikTok. What is it going to say? They're, all it is is cursing the Prophet, cursing Islam, Islamophobia. When you go to YouTube and you're trying to learn your religion from YouTube, what is it? It's all Islamophobia. It's all anti-Islamic. Everything against your religion. So you're going to learn about the Quran and you're learning everything against it. You're going to learn about the Sunnah and you're learning everything against it. The proper place to go, if you were to go anywhere, if you want to go, you have a problem with your kidneys, you have a problem with your physical condition in your body, you go to the hospital. One of the signs of misguided scholars, what is one of the signs of the misguided scholars? They don't have masjid. They don't lead a community. Their community is YouTube community. This is a sign of a misguided imam a misguided sheikh, a misguided speaker. Why don't you have a community? I'm asking. Why don't you know how to lead namaz? Namaz khonna Do you know how to lead namaz? Let me tell you why he's not at a masjid. Because at a masjid, people are Muslim. People follow orthodoxy. People follow rules. People follow Quran and people follow sunnah. For 1400 years, why is this person only on YouTube and this person doesn't have a masjid and he doesn't have a community. He doesn't know what's going on in the community. He has a little office. He sits from there. He has 500,000 followers because he's just talking crap. He's talking trash. And people like trash talk. So he gets a lot of followers. Khalif Tu'raf. Oppose, say something new and people will follow you. Say something new and people will listen to you. Whereas does he represent Islam? My dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ said that near the end of time, there will be callers standing at the gateway of Jahannam. Du'atun ala abwab nar They're actually standing at the gateway of hellfire and they're pulling people into hellfire. They don't have, they don't have any uh, masjid. They don't have any community. They don't know the situation that's going on with the youth. All they do is sit there and they criticize the Quran and they criticize the Hadith. And they criticize the Quran and they criticize the Hadith. And then what did they say? They, and not, not a single one of them has any qualifications in Islamic studies. Ask them, did, I will give them one page from any Arabic book, children's book. Children's book. I will give them, read to me and translate for me this Arabic. He will not be able to translate because he doesn't know the Arabic language. How is a person who doesn't know the Arabic language commenting on the Quran? Can somebody answer me that, please? For God's sake. 
How is a person who does not know Arabic, he doesn't know the language of the Qur'an, he never studied the Qur'an, he didn't sit in front of a teacher, and I will give him a children's atfal book, a children's book, he will not be able to even explain it. But four or five hundred thousand followers are following this person. Someone who has no qualifications in Islam, someone who has no credentials in Islam, somebody who has no masjid, no community. He cannot even lead Muslims properly. He cannot even make tilawat of Surah Al-Fatiha. MashaAllah, big Imam. Imam Al-Muslimin, Amir Al-Mu'mineen. He's not Imam Al-Muslimin, right? He's Imam Al-Jahileen. Only jahil people will follow him. So my dear brothers and sisters, don't fall into this jahl. Don't fall into this ignorance. The first thing that you do when you go to a doctor, you have to see is this person qualified. We see the qualifications of this person. We see if this person has any credentials. Where did this person study? It, you, you know, did he study in Stanford? And then the higher level, we know, okay, he's a doctor. He's at Stanford University, subhanAllah. But it seems like when somebody has a YouTube page, it's like just having the YouTube page is the biggest credential now that allows you to speak on Islamic affairs. The more loud, the more obnoxious, the more you can make fun of people, and the more you can say something that you never heard in your life before. For 1400 years, people understood the Quran that alcohol is haram. A person comes and says, Alcohol is not really haram. You can, really, you can drink a little bit of it. Fourteen hundred years, people didn't understand Islam. Now he understood Islam. Subhanallah. After 1,400 years, this person understood Islam. Brothers and sisters, where is our aql? Where is our, our common sense? When we see somebody talking like this, immediately I say, wow, that's interesting. For 1400 years, somebody didn't say like this, now you're saying it. So when we hear that, then this is what the Prophet ﷺ said, that beware of those people, that they will start telling you things that neither you or your forefathers have ever heard in your life before. This is actually the Prophet foretelling us. This is the prophecy of Rasulullah ﷺ. Beware of those people who when they give da'wah and they talk, they will tell you about things that neither you nor your forefathers have ever heard in your life. Things that are completely opposite of the teachings of Islam. So, brothers and sisters, the going back to the Quran and the Sunnah, this is the perspective of a believer. That when we have this perspective, one of our lens is the Quran and the other lens is the Hadith, the world you'll be able to see it from the proper lens, from the proper understanding. But that is when you have a proper source, going to those people who are qualified, going to those people who are the right source of the Qur'an and Sunnah. I was mentioning a story of Hatim al-Asam, where he was pondering over the Qur'an, and every single aspect of it, he said that, what did you learn from me? Oh, my student. He says, I was in your company for 30 years, and I learned eight things. And I want, to, I want, to, I want you to see how this student of the Qur'an understood the Qur'an. How today people are understanding the Qur'an, they're going to the most ambiguous verses or the most confusing verses and they're going into that. They're not, you know, taking from the Qur'an for their morality. They're not taking for, for, from the Qur'an for their guidance. They're going to those ayat of the Qur'an which are confusing them. Why are you going to those ayat of the Qur'an? Allah Azza wa said that there are verses that are clear cut that guide you and then there are certain verses about Allah there are certain verses about the creator who is going to be able to understand the creator the creator is infinite how are you going to understand the infinite as for those people in whose heart there is a disease they go to those verses of the Quran which are mutashabihat which are ambiguous and then they, what did they do? They confuse themselves. Go to those ayat that talk about mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. Go to those ayat that guide you. 
to telling the truth and living an honest life and taqwa and fear of Allah Azza wa and helping other human beings. Go to those ayat so that you have a moral foundation. But what do we want? We want to go to those things that we have something for table talk. We have something to discuss. We have something to, you know, uh, converse about. We have something to have a discussion about. We have something to have a debate about. Whereas thousands of ayat of the Quran talk about the fear of Allah, talk about the love of Allah, talk about the mercy of Allah, talk about the forgiveness of Allah, and talk about all the other, as Allah Ta'ala says, Quran yahdi lillati hiya aqwam. This Quran guides us to the most upright, beautiful things, that if a person were to bring it in his life, subhanAllah, this person would become the closest thing to a perfect human being. And this is what we need. And here he mentions, I got eight things, Eight things, and I mentioned previously. He said, I looked at, look at how he's understanding the Qur'an. We see some people, they're just going to those verses to cause confusion. But look at this person who's looking to the Qur'an for guidance, looking to, to the Qur'an for direction. He says, number one, I saw all of the creation. They have love for something. But then I noticed every single one of their beloveds are leaving them. No matter who you love in this world, your beloved is going to leave you one day. If you love your wealth, your wealth is going to leave you. If you love your children and your wife, your wife and your children and your family, they're going to leave you one day when you pass away from this world. He said, but I realized there is one thing, one beloved that is going to go with you inside of the grave. It will accompany you. And I saw that th those are my good deeds and my actions. So then I made my good deeds my beloved. My righteous deeds, my hasanat, my charity, my good works in the life of this world, I made this my beloved. Because when you make your good deeds your beloved, you will stick with it and it will follow you inside of the grave when everyone has left behind. Secondly, he said, I saw all the people following whatever they want to do, following their desires, like we see today. Whatever you feel, just do that. Whatever you like, Whatever desires you have, just follow your desires. And where do your desires leave, lead you? Your desires will lead you to destruction. So he says, I seen all the people following their desires. But I saw this ayah of the Quran. And as for the one who fears the standing before his Lord, the reckoning in front of Allah. And he restrains his self from temptations, then what? فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى Then paradise will be his abode. So what did I do? If going against your lowly desires and your shahawat and your passions and your temptations, if going against that is going to bring you to paradise, then I will go against that. I won't follow that because following that is going to lead you to destruction and going against your desires is going to lead you to paradise as Allah Ta'ala said. So I made an effort to oppose my desires. Those desires of mine that are haram. Those desires that are not permissible. He said, thirdly, رَأَيْتَ كُلُّ وَاحِدٍ مِنَ النَّاسِ يَسْعَى فِي جَمْعِ حُطَامِ الدُّنْيَا I saw that the people are gathering more and more and more and more money. That money which is for your necessities, we need to gather that. That is for your necessities. It's for your rent, it's for your bills, it's for your family, it's for your needs and necessities. No problem, gather that. But that which is extra from that, should not a portion of that go to those who are in need? Somebody was telling me, Shaykh, you know, if God is so merciful, why is there so much people suffering from hunger in the world? This is a very, very common question. He said, Shaykh, if God is so merciful and God is so loving, why is there so much hungry people in the world? So my answer to that is that first and foremost, don't blame everything on God. Everything that happens in this world that you see that might not be good, don't blame it on God because God said, وَلَا يَرْضَى لِعِبَادِهِ الْكُفُرِ Allah is not pleased with His slaves that they should commit kufr or that they should commit sins. Allah is not pleased with that. But God gave us free will. 
Imagine if all the rich people, all the rich Muslims, not even people, I'm not talking about the non-Muslims, just the rich Muslims, they would give their zakat. You're saying, you're, you're saying God is so merciful and loving. Why is there people that are suffering from hunger in the world? I'm, I'm asking you a question. What do you think would happen if the Muslims who are wealthy, we have Muslims who are wealthy that own entire countries. They can buy out countries. They're trillionaires and billionaires. Muslim country, Muslims only. If they were to just give their zakat, do you think that there would be hungry people in the world? I don't think so. So now let me ask you this question. Whose fault is it? Is it God's fault? Or did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to leave something for us and Allah is testing us? Allah gave us wealth and He said, وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And those who are the believers, they spend from that which we give them. Isn't it? Isn't that what Allah Ta'ala said? Allah Ta'ala says, وَفِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ مَعْلُومٌ لِلسَّائِلِ وَالْمَحْرُومِ Every one of us, there is a stipulated portion in our wealth for those who will ask and for those who are in need. Is this not what the Allah said in the Quran? So whose fault is this? Is it Allah's fault? Or, astaghfirullah, or is it, the, is it the fault of us that so much superfluous wealth we have in the Muslim world? Do you think the Muslim world is lacking money? No, the Muslim world is lacking morality. The Muslim, the Muslim world is not lacking money or wealth. They have more wealth than the non-Muslim world. The Muslim world has more wealth than the non-Muslim world. That's why we see the alliances between the West and the East. Because the West wants what the East has. A lot of these proxy wars that are taking place in the, in the Eastern world and in the Arab countries and in many of the Muslim countries, all of these wars are because of the resources that the Muslims have. But what is our attitude in regards to that? No, no, no. If I have, it's going to be for myself. I will not even allow this money to be given to the people of my own neighborhood. Go to any of the Muslim countries and you will see this situation. You have an elite, one group of people, they're wealthy. Right? They're extremely wealthy. And then what do you have after that? You have a whole category of people that are completely in below the level of poverty. Where does this come from? This comes from not following the teachings of the Quran. The Quran in and of itself has commanded us, وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ وَفِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ مَعْلُومٌ وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ If just these three ayat would be implemented, he's saying this, if just these three ayat were to be implemented, you would not have any poor people. They say that this has actually happened in the time of Umar ibn Khattab or Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. That because of the distribution of the wealth and distribution of the zakat, in Medina Munawwara, they did not find any poor people that you can actually give zakat to. Because all the people, they were made wealthy. Everybody was giving their zakat. And everybody was giving the charity. And everybody was taking care of their neighbors. They didn't find anyone in Medina Munawwara that was mustahiq of zakat. So what do you do if there's no people there in your city that is mustahiq of zakat? You go to the next city. So they were looking in Makkah Mukarrama. Couldn't find anybody. They were looking in the whole area of Hijaz. They couldn't find any people that was mustahiq of zakat. This was in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Where the adl and the justice and the people were implementing what Allah commanded them. Just spend from what Allah has given you. Whatever is superfluous of your wealth, 2.5%. This is nothing. 2.5% out of a thousand dollars. What is that? It's like $25. Out of $100 is $2.50. 2.5% from $100 is $2.50. Right? And you go and you just add the, you, you go up and you just add the zero. How little is that? But if everybody were to do that in a locality, what do you think would be? That's the superfluous of your wealth. That's the extra of your wealth. And you share that extra with those who are in need. What would happen in that whole society? In the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, they did not find any community 
or village that was mustahiq of zakat until they went all the way to Yemen and in Yemen in some village there they found that there was some village of people that was in need and then they took the zakat money collected there and then they spent it upon those people imagine imagine the justice but where did this come from this came from implementing the Quran it didn't come from saying oh blaming everything on God it's God's fault it's not God's fault it's our fault if we implement these teachings God is loving that's why he commanded us to help others God is loving and more, most generous that's why he told us spend from what I have given you because this is my money but I have put you in charge of it spend of my money that I have given you subhanallah brothers and sisters these are the things these are the teachings that if we were to implement it it would literally it's so simple but we don't implement that which is simple we go after those verses that we want to be confused we want to have discussions we want to have debates we want to argue we don't want to go to the thing that is simple because the simple things are the things that bring change and these things when you talk about it it doesn't require me to spend any money it doesn't require me to you know give uh, and, and share and, and give charity to the poor but it, it, it gives me entertainment it entertains me and this is unfortunately our religious discussions have been literally uh, centralized in these type of things what can I listen to and what can I talk about that entertains me whereas the reality that thing which actually makes us go and do something this masjid that we are sitting in subhanallah this is all the blessing imagine this is all the blessing of the Muslim community we don't get we don't get handouts from the government this is an honor for us we don't get handouts from the government we don't get handouts from the hukuma this is something that the Muslim ummah implementing the teachings of the Quran that we're able to establish all of this this is the beauty Brothers and sisters, may Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq to understand these things. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala guide us to follow the teachings of the Qur'an in the way that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will then take us to higher levels of morality. Wa akhiru da'wana